I want to thank John and, and thank Bernie and um, thank Congressman Gibson. This is the, the first time that I've met him and uh, had the opportunity to hear him speak. Um, and I want to say that because uh, you're going to hear things in my remarks that are very similar. Um, so I want that said before any great conspiracy goes out, um, <laughs> that the congressman and I have never spoken before, and we certainly didn't talk uh, about our comments. I also um, want to say before any great conspiracy goes out, that you may have noticed I wasn't here when the pledge uh, was said. I believe in the pledge. I say the pledge. I did not go out in, uh, in a protest. I know you think all Democrats protest everything. I was actually out uh, speaking with the media, so uh, had I been here, I, I uh, of course would have said the pledge. It is a pleasure to be here. Uh, I have to tell you that um, I was pleasantly surprised by the amount of attention that my getting invited here and my being here has garnered. And I think that that attention speaks to why it was important for me to accept your invitation and why I was so gratified that you gave it uh, to me. Um, as the congressman, as Chris talked about, you know, we are an exceptional country. And we have this tremendous American history. And it's an American tradition of respectful dialogue and discussion that unfortunately, fairly recently, uh, has fallen kind of by the wayside. We do have uh, the model that we can follow of Jefferson and Adams. Uh, they're the forerunners of the Democratic and Republican Party, and they had a friendship that had its friction points. And Jefferson himself said that he and Adams were often separated by, quote, different conclusions we had drawn from our political reading. Nevertheless, despite those friction points, they had a great historic transformative friendship, and we are the beneficiaries of that. They both died on July 4th, uh, 1826, and Adams died later, although he didn't know that Jefferson had died. And Adams' last words were, Thomas Jefferson survives. And I think of that to think that here are two men that had the greatest of friction points, and yet when John Adams died, his life's work, he thought, was in good hands because Thomas Jefferson survived. It's a model that I think that we can all benefit from. But as Americans, we also have another model that we can, that uh, historic model that exists. And that's Alexander Hamilton and Aaron Burr. And with the great Broadway play right now, which uh, I have not had an opportunity to see, and based upon its reviews, I probably won't until I'm about 105. Um, <laughs> Alexander Burr, uh, excuse me, Alexander Hamilton, the Federalist, and Aaron Burr, the Republican Party, had a lifelong political and personal battle over mostly minor things. It culminated in a duel over which most historians agree was a minor slight that Hamilton uttered at a dinner party. Burr had hoped that by challenging Hamilton a duel, he would revive his floundering political career. And instead, when it was over, one of our great founding fathers and a New Yorker was dead, and Burr was wanted for murder and never had a political career again. We, as Americans, have a choice about which relationship we emulate, the Jefferson and Adams or the Hamilton and Burr. I choose to try to emulate the Jefferson and Adams, and part of that, I think, is why I'm a mayor, because mayors are problem solvers. There is no, to quote that phrase, there is no Republican or Democrat way to pick up garbage. And having been mayor for six years, I can tell you that there's also no correct way to pick up garbage. Everybody's going to tell you all the time what you're doing wrong and occasionally what you're doing right. But I learned early as mayor, and as a survival technique, that the spirit of listening goes a long way. And so with that spirit of listening and having a dialogue, I came here today to speak with you uh, and uh, to answer your invitation. With that same spirit of listening, uh, 18 months ago, some very good and thoughtful people came to see me for support to undertake a study to look at ways of making government in Onondaga County more effective and more efficient. And as I said, I'm a mayor, I'm a problem solver, and I also am open to new ideas. And in fact, I'm kind of a closet nerd, and for the people who work with me every day, they probably would tell you maybe I'm not so closet about my nerdishness. So I said, yes, of course, 
and I instructed my staff and my employees to fully cooperate in providing data and answering questions and attending meetings over this 18 month period. And as the mayor, I had a great deal of experience in effective and efficient new ways to order government. Uh, along with Onondaga County, uh, we co-located our economic development departments. We merged the city plant purchasing into the county uh, purchasing. We have shared services with a joint city-county planning agency. So I'm not somebody who comes to this discussion reflexively no. In fact, just the opposite. But I also know from my experience that in order to do these kind of things, you need data, you need a goal, and most important, ironically, you need consensus in order to get it done. So the consensus came out with their, they were coming out with their preliminary recommendations and they came to me and said, we would appreciate it if you would for 30 days not say anything about these recommendations. Let people have a chance to absorb this themselves and think about it themselves without you bigfooting this. We said, you know what, that's a reasonable request. And so I did. And so for the first time in arguably about 15 years, and a question of important local government structure, I was deliberately silent on. And as I said to you, I am in favor of good and new ideas. And I think also that a community discussion about government service and its future is a good thing. That's probably why I'm involved in politics and why I run for office. And these, this report came out and it had 51 recommendations. And there's a lot of good things in those 50 recommendations. But what rapidly happened, and too rapidly it happened, is that recommendation 51, uh, which I don't know if they knew the idea of what area 51 <laughs> was, it perverse to me that they did. Recommendation 51, which was the county taking over the city, um, and then towns and villages would have the option to opt in, became the only discussion point. It was the only thing people were talking about. And over and over again, everywhere I went, everybody asked me, are you in favor of it? Are you against it? And as, as I said, for 30 days, I had a, this ability to, to not answer that question. But just because I wasn't publicly answering that question doesn't mean I wasn't thinking about it. And while I was thinking about it and doing my research, I realized that it was almost impossible to answer that question. Are you in favor of it or are you against it? because there's huge questions out there that have not been answered. For example, the, the, the issue of representation. What we in the city call voting rights, but maybe what might be familiar to you is the concept of no taxation without representation. What happens to people who live in the city? What will be their government? How will their tax money be spent? Who will be in charge of that? There's been no answer about that. The city has a general obligation debt of $472 million that has not in any way been addressed. The New York State Constitution says that you can't dissolve the city with its general obligation debt because the city is able to issue debt based on the full faith and credit based on the state constitution. So if you can't eliminate the city for the purposes of the debt, then what happens to that debt? And again, you go back to the issue of representation. Who pays for that debt? Now these may be all very wonky policy questions for all of you, but they go back to the very nature of governance. That how we pay for our fire trucks and our police cars and pave our roads and our water mains is how we bond and what we bond with that. So if we don't know the answers to that, or most importantly, who's making those decisions, it's kind of hard to say. In fact, I would say it is impossible to responsibly say whether you are in favor of it or whether you are against it. The city also, like all governments, has what is called OPED, other post-employment benefits liabilities, of $680 million. Nothing has been said about how you go about paying that or, or what happens to that. So I really felt, as this process was unfolding and I was asked over and over again, I felt a little bit like that joke about, well, other than that, Mrs. Lincoln, how was the play? <laughs> Because other than these issues of representation and debt and general obligation, how can you answer this question? And I heard over and over again the phrase, well, you have to trust us. Now, I can tell you here is, a, is perhaps an indication of when it's helpful to be a woman in elective office. 
Because women understand that phrase, trust us or trust me. We've been through that before. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. So trust us is not, I think, an answer. But I also think that trust us in terms of when you are talking about the most sacred obligation about governing people and the services that they provide is not an acceptable answer either. So the, in this recommendation, they came up with a chart that said there was $100 million in redundant services. They were going to reduce government spending by $20 million right away. They were going to save $200 a year by consolidating services. And the question was asked, how, where, where are you going to do that? And no data has come back on that. It was, well, we looked at some sheets and we saw that we thought that there were some areas of similarity. Having been in government for as long as I have been in and dealing with budgets, I can tell you what on the surface may seem similar when you get underneath it is not. And experts, both progressive experts and conservative experts like um, E.J. McMahon will tell you that in order for consolidation to save money, you need to have duplication and economies of scale. Otherwise, all you're doing is taking the same debt and just spreading it over a broader tax base. Mm -hmm. So over and over again, the questions were asked, as I read about it and heard from people who call me, where's the data? Show us the information. Prove to us this point. And what came back were threats, we're going to take away your money, or stop being negative. Now I can tell you as somebody who's run for office, when you respond to a question seeking data or information with a threat or stop being negative, that's, that dog won't hunt. And that dog particularly won't hunt in the city of Syracuse and I suspect uh, uh, also in Onondaga County. At the same time that this if we were, people were asking for this information, uh, I started doing a little digging on my own um, because over and over again we have heard the example of the merger of Louisville as being this hugely successful merger. And there's a professor from Louisville who has done an extraordinary amount of work on the Louisville consolidation. And he has said, based on his studies, on the pre-data and post-data uh, economy, demonstrates that radical change in government was not met by new economic energies. And in this article called Beyond the Rhetoric, he says, officials from central cities should be cautious about assuming that a city-county consolidation will be a benefit. As crucial cases that others might consult, our study raises the doubt that city-county city consolidation can enhance local economic development. Most scholars would acknowledge that the ability of local government to affect larger economic forces is quite limited. Once a campaign is underway, Politicians are bound to inflate promises of economic development, and although resort to winning argument is to be expected, the public should also do what it must to keep public officials honest. In short, we need to be attentive to any possible mismatch between claims and reality. And this is not easy, because the media and proponents are naturally anxious to construct narratives that claim the supposed remedy regardless of the facts. We have not heard anything about the other side of Louisville, which this presents, nor these warning instructions. But we have also seen that people like their local governments. And I think that's because we fix problems, or we at the very least try to fix problems. And as local government officials, we can't run away, and we don't want to run away. So, I bring these, these things to your attention to say that there is a lot of information out there. And there's even more importantly, missing data out there. So when people come to me and say, so Mayor Miner, what do you think about consensus? And all of you are going to be asked by the media, what did the mayor say about consensus? Is she in favor of consensus? Translation, is she in favor of the city-county consolidation? I think the responsible answer for all of us who care about our community and who govern is to say that there are too many important unanswered questions and information to simply be able to say I am in favor of it or I am against it. That much more information and dialogue needs to be had. But as I said, I think that this has been an important process and a good process. <coughs> Part of also what I wanted to talk to you about today is what I think was driving consensus. And that is 
our overall experience with poor economic development. And in fact, consensus said as much when it said in its uh, prelimi preliminaries recommendations, Syracuse and Onondaga County should be attractive to investment and development, yet economic development is slow and backwards at worst. And they also said later on in the text, things need to change. And I agree, things do need to change. For me, the next question though is, well, who needs to change? Or what needs to change? And do we need to change? Is it us? Is it Syracuse? Is it Onondaga County? Is it Central New York? And I thought maybe one of the best ways to answer that question is to look at what's going on across the state and other places. All of the slides, uh, with the exception of the slides of the Founding Fathers that uh, I have in front of you, are all drawn from other documents. These are nothing that I put together. They are drawn from other places uh, so I don't want you to think that I am uh, making this information up. So let's look at the city of Albany. The city of Albany this year announced that it has a $12.5 million deficit that New York State had to fill. If not, the mayor said the city of Albany would be insolvent. It would be bankrupt. This is a deficit that will recur every single year. This is from the Times Union. Or how about the city of Rochester right to the uh, west of us? And there, their investigative reporter, Rachel Barnard, said, we still have more than 40,000 fewer people employed than we did in the 90s here in the Rochester area. 40,000 fewer people in the workforce, 40,000 fewer people that have jobs. So how can you be so bright about what's happening? Further to the west, in the city of Buffalo, the investigative post there did what they call the real state of the city, where they showed the job growth in Buffalo is below what it is across the country, and in fact, across New York State. It also went on to look at the city itself, and said that the city and the schools all continue to have deficits, but there is a four-year anticipation growing reliance on state aid. So the question is, what has happened? These are all, I know all of these are good cities with good people, good committed people who are running these cities. And the answer is that this is not a city by city issue. This is an economic development issue with the systems that are currently in place. So Mildred Warner, a Cornell University professor, did a chart here for a presentation that she gave to the New York Conference of Mayors a couple of years ago. And what you can see here is where the US average is and then underneath there are all of our cities and regions that are underperforming the, uh, the U.S. average. But what you also get a sense of seeing is that without New York City, you would get, you would understand how desperate our economic straits are. And the good little engine of Ithaca because of Cornell University and research and development. This is again all data that's showing that our regions have not recovered. So what needs to change? How do we change this? Well, one of the things that Mildred Warner showed was that each of these places that when we talk about mandate relief, that New York State has the highest level of decentralization of fiscal responsibility of any state in the nation. So that's a lot of uh, professor speak. What does that mean? That New York State is taking everything that it wants done and telling the localities to pay for it. So when we in the localities say mandate relief, mandate relief, and people in Albany roll their eyes and say, I'm so tired of that phrase, well, it's because whether you are a school district or a city or a county with Medicaid, so much of what you are being told to pay for is the things that they tell you to pay for. And when you don't have the ability, or when they don't have to pay for what they tell you to pay for, you get these things that are out of whack, property taxes that far exceed what they should be. Uh, when you say, well, we want to freeze property taxes, but when you don't address what is driving property taxes up, that's the situations that you get here. Underinvestment in education, underinvestment in infrastructure, and localities who are desperate. So uh, one of the things that clearly needs to change is that there needs to be mandate relief. Mandate relief, by the way, that we were promised as local officials would go hand in glove with the property tax cap, and yet it hasn't done it. So what has been the state's economic growth strategy, since we are all clearly in the same boat of the state? As I said before, the congressman and I have not spoken since today. Well, it's startup New York. 
I didn't put the commercial on here because you've all seen the commercials. So what's the data on the success for Startup New York? Well, it's very hard to come by. But according to the story, more than 150 companies have enrolled in the program pledging 4,000 jobs over five years. Compare that to what we have spent on Startup New York and advertising. $207 million on ads for 150 companies, 4,000 jobs. Seems out of whack. But what also comes along with this is this growing sense that we have what I have started to call contributor capitalism. <coughs> that there is a troubling coincidence between tax breaks being given to campaign contributors. And we have seen that over and over. And in fact, that process has now started to begin to be called a process of press, promises, and payouts. And this is what happens when you have a system that is out of whack. When you have a system that is so desperate for economic developments that tax breaks become expected. And absolutely, in upstate New York, everybody believes, every developer believes, that they're entitled to a tax break. Now, while I am, many of you have not heard me speak in person about this, I trust that you have heard me talk about this over and over again. It's not just Syracuse and Central New York where this is going on, it's going on across the state. So as evidence of that, I wanted to share with you that the Erie County Executive, Mark Polakars, put this Facebook page, uh, post up, I think it was last week. Thank you to the members of the Ham Amherst IDA who voted against giving additional tax breaks for a hotel project. They did the right thing by rejecting the view of developers that they are entitled to a tax break. No one is entitled to a tax break, especially on a project that does not create new net economic benefit to the community. Great job and thanks for holding the Erie County IDA uh, by rejecting corporate handouts that benefit no one but the developers. Well, we have here our own example of it, and it would not be a Stephanie Minor speech if I did not speak about Destin. So, in 2007, when I was on the council, the developers um, de um, promised us the Leaves of Grass Hotel. It was going to be a $450 million hotel. This is actually Congressman, this is their rendering. Uh, it was going to be 39 stories, and it was going to be the largest building outside of New York City. Now, they received a 30-year tax break on the single largest piece of taxable land in the city of Syracuse for building the only commitment they made was 800,000 square feet of retail space. But they told the community that they were going to build much more and they told the community that they were going to build a hotel. They said it was going to be like, quote, nothing like it in the world. Well, the word, word nothing in that sentence was probably the most accurate because nothing happened. And I became mayor, and in 2015, there started to be this idea circulated that they wanted to come back for a an additional tax break to build a new hotel. And not surprisingly, that was not going to happen with the city of Syracuse. This new hotel project, though, was going to be a $48 million seven-story hotel with approximately $7 million in tax exemptions. That looks a little bit different. So, as I said, I said no, and then they promptly went to Onondaga County, who will, in all intents and purposes, uh, the uh, Onondaga County IDA will say yes. So, I don't really blame the developers, because if we continue to engage in this behavior where they just get tax break after tax break after tax break, well, why shouldn't they ask? It's up to us to say no. It's up to us to say that this kind of economic development process is completely flawed, and leaves all of us behind. Now, I can tell you that I will continue to wage this war. It is arguably how I got to be elected mayor, and it's how I'm going to continue to do it until my last day as the, uh, as the mayor. Because economic development, the way that we are doing it in, in uh, New York State, does not work. It does not work for the people of my city. It doesn't work for the people in this room. It works for the very wealthy and the very few who are getting all the benefits, making promises, and not having commitments. But this goes to the point about consensus and the things that they have said and recommended. 
Do we need to change? Of course we need to change. But what we have to do is uh, follow this quote of another great mayor. What you've got to do is be honest. Say what you believe and give it to them straight and just don't wuss out. Now I hope I've been an, uh, an elected official long enough for all of you to say, well, we may not agree with Stephanie Minor, but we know she never wusses out. <laughs> so with those, uh, with uh, Mayor Bloomberg's words in mind, and I realize it's kind of a little ironic that I'd be talking to a group of conservatives and quoting Mayor Bloomberg, uh, but with those words in mind, let me sum up. Is change necessary? Of course change is necessary. But how and what successful is the su successful strategy for the change that we need and that we know the people in our community deserve? I will tell you the same thing that I tell every single group that I meet with who asks me this question. The only way that we will get positive change is if you all continue to stay active in the democratic process. And while that may seem unusual, if not altogether risky for a self-proclaimed progressive Democrat to urge a group of conservatives to stay active, I tell you that I believe strongly, and that's the reason I came this morning, that we will have a better society when all of us are involved in the vibrant process of governance and when we all talk to each other. So in this uh, most heated of election years, I will leave you with a phrase, I look forward to seeing you all on the hustings, whether we are on one side of that or on the other side of that. That I respect you as American citizens, and I respect the fact that you have every right to stand up for what you believe in, and that we will be a better society if we can do that in a civil way, and we continue to have a dialogue, not a monologue of smear campaigns. Thank you all very much.